Okay, guys, welcome to the fourth meeting of our brain-based learning class. And the first burning question I need to ask is, is this me or me, or is this? <laughs> this? This. I think this, probably. <laughs> That's why I think that I can kind of identify with the... Oh, really? Thank you. <laughs> I have that potential. <laughs> okay. Um, Today we're going to um, leave the bucket analogy that I've actually used in the past of filling students' brains and having them retain things in long-term memory and move to um, a more active sort of metaphor as lighting a fire. We're going to talk about strategies for enabling students to become good thinkers and to retain material by actively working with it. So. Um, as a kind of preview and a, something to pique your interest, I want you to look at this true and false test. So the first question, make up your mind whether it's true or false. It helps students to make faulty predictions. Number two, Animoto is a modern day fictional character loosely based on Quasimodo from Hunchback of Notre Dame. Three, having students teach new information to someone else produces, on average, 90% retention. And finally, encouraging students to Twitter will improve their retention of material. The mystery question. OK, stay tuned. <laughs> OK, so um, we're talking today about promoting thinking. And what we need to do is get our students to mentally manipulate material in order to retain it and to make it their own. So in other words, they have to do something with the material in order for it to be useful and to be retained. I'm going to divide up this talk in terms of what you can do before you present material, what you can do as you're presenting the material and getting the students to work with it, and then what you can do after you've presented the material to help them rehearse it and to make it meaningful to themselves so that they can retain it. So we'll start with what to do before the lesson begins. We want to stimulate curiosity. And one of the ways that we can do that is to have something novel for students to look at and wonder why it is you're presenting it to them. Another thing to do is a little bit more directly to ask them to make a prediction of some sort about what's coming up. So if you, they predict um, what the picture or the little bit of music or the little video that you show them is going to um, tie in with the upcoming lesson, you really grab their attention. And they're going to be with you at that point. They base their predictions on material that they already know or think they know. So of course, oftentimes, students have erroneous ideas about things. But they love to give their opinion, right? And they love to consult their prior knowledge. So this should be a way to engage them. According to neurologist Judy Willis, when students make a prediction, it, and the prediction turns out to be accurate, that is very thrilling to them. And so they have a little dopamine release. But even if the prediction is inaccurate, that actually creates a teachable moment where they are, their brain is alert. Like, what? Something isn't what I thought it was going to be. So there's a kind of a novelty in that as well. One of the things you could do to um, try this out is play a little bit of music that's relevant to the topic for the day. I picked one that I could use in my personal development course, just, and I, I know that's a little easier than a math course or something like that, but um, since uh, this could be something I could actually do, I thought I would show it to you. Uh, we have a chapter on loneliness and solitude, and we make a big deal about how different they are. You can be alone and enjoying it quite a bit, or you could be in a crowd of people and be lonely. So we clarify the difference between those two concepts. And then you could ask students to think of a song that would be about solitude and how a person maybe is enjoying that solitude. We can borrow ideas from our contemporary society and use them in the classroom to be more effective. 
one of the things that advertisers do is they hook you in, and even news programs do that. Before they go to a commercial break, they have some little thing that you probably want to know about so that you'll stay tuned and put up with the commercials. So we can use that too, have coming attractions, something like um, a movie trailer. So here is a, a scene from a movie trailer. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But uh, it certainly draws you in. There's something dramatic going on. And um, the normal person is going to wonder what the heck they're talking about and what's so urgent. So a trailer is meant to grab attention. And there's no reason why we can't do something like that as well. If we could create techniques that um, will be suspenseful, there's no reason why they can't be completely relevant to what we're going to teach the students and not something is ju that's just uh, attention grabbing but doesn't lead into what we want them to know. One of the things that is a resource that I'm not sure if you know about is Animoto.com. And this is a facility that's absolutely free for educators that will enable you to get help making a video, something like a trailer. Um, from a movie that could lead into whatever it is you want students to know. And what they do is you give them some of the materials to work with, and then they put it together for you. Your students can also use that. And they could um, use it as a summary of what they've read in outside reading. They could present it to the class, or they could um, use it to summarize what they, we talked about in class. Other ways you can stimulate curiosity are using current events, bringing in something from the paper. I know I listen to the news in the morning. And if there's something relevant to my classes, I like to start with that. And um, you know, the world out there is a pretty amazing place. And almost every day, there's something you could grab to start the day. You could create a PowerPoint of images that are related to the upcoming lesson. Again, just visuals instead of a picture, if you want to do it that way. Um, or you can just use a photograph and post it up. One of the recommendations is that you can put it up actually a week before you're going to talk about this topic and have maybe a little uh, question up as a caption for it. So, I mean, of course, I picked something relevant to psychology. This is maybe could lead into a discussion of Freudian psychoanalysis. Um, here's only this is a contemporary person um, laying on the couch. Another thing um, that's an option is having your students talk to the author of the textbook and um, ask questions like, uh, what are you going to tell me in this chapter? And um, here's what I already know about this topic. So I predict this is what we're going to be talking about. Now, of course, many times students don't have a clue. And so we have ways to get them to look at all the uh, bold face subheadings in the chapter. And so they could do that and then speculate on what the chapter is going to be about if they would be absolutely without an idea before they start. OK, so those are things that you can do before you ever present material. And now we're going to talk about some things that would be useful in the classroom. Remember, after that 20 minutes of lecture, it's always a good idea to have students work with the material for five minutes or so before you go on and they're fresh again. OK, so one of the best things to do to get uh, students thinking and clear on material is to do a compare and contrast. So I thought it would be kind of fun to just pick something to compare and contrast. Can you give me two ways that these women are alike and two ways that they're different? They both have dark hair. They both have dark hair. They're both smiling. They're both smiling. They're wearing different colored shirts. They're wearing different colored shirts. They're wearing different earrings. Different earrings. Oh, one has earrings. And, oh, yeah, they do both have earrings, don't they? OK, I didn't notice that. All right. So some of these differences and similarities would be more relevant than others. So for example, the fact that they're different ages, and it appears that one is the mother and one is the daughter, might be a very relevant difference. Right? So there's a generational difference here, too. And um, any, anyway, it certainly gets you to look very closely at the material. And that's the point I'm trying to make. 
there's no reason this can't be fun. So here's a kind of a cute graphic organizer that could be used to do this difference in similarity. You could have a, another page with the contrast, right, so that they could um, play around with it. It's always nice to put a little fun in it. So graphic organizers are instructional tools that illustrate our knowledge about a topic. And so we're going to spend a couple minutes on that. There are lots of different types. And I know that you researched this um, during the time that we've been apart. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what you came up with. So they can be maps. And we'll um, look at an example of that. Timelines, flow charts. We've worked with the KWL tables uh, in previous sessions. So I threw that in there so you could kind of make the connection. And then cause and effect diagrams. It, how many of you are familiar with the fishbone chart? OK, well, I brought one today, and I'll show you a little bit later when we have our share and tell. OK, according to Judy Willis, graphic organizers are like external prefrontal cortex. And that is that they work, and they organize information the way your brain naturally does it anyway. Your brain sorts things in terms of categories of meaning. And then when you remember something, it sort of scrapes those together. And it only stores fragments of the information and relies on its great ingenuity to put in the missing blanks. It's so good at that that we almost never realize that we haven't retained the whole story. But that explains why errors are sometimes made in our memory, is that we really didn't store it as a complete item. OK, another kind of fun graphic organizer that I found, I mean, really, that's a lot of fun. And it does make the point, though. So we've got the main idea of the story, the detail one, detail two, detail three, and the concluding sentence. It's a great way to illustrate how this thing is supposed to be laid out. Some of the intellectual skills that are required of students when they use graphic organizers are prioritizing, categorizing, and recognizing relationships. So they're doing some high quality thinking when they work with these things. They're beneficial because students must summarize a lot of information. And that means that they're going to have to figure out what needs to be retained, what's central, and what isn't. And they're going to be very active when they're doing this process. They can do it. Uh, as a group, or they could do it by themselves. Either way works uh, equally well. OK, so um, this is one of the graphic organizers. This is probably the most basic one, at least that I found in my research. And it's sometimes called on-demand mapping. It has a central theme in the middle. It's got little tentacles that are um, going out for the facts and the details of the issue. It's colorful, so it's very eye-grabbing. Um, this is kind of a plain version of it. And then let's see one in actual reality. Again, I picked something from psychology uh, just for convenience, since that was our assignment, is to pick one that would, that would be relevant to our field. So this is a very famous Howard Gardner's Types of Intelligence. Um, he basically um, started with seven, and he plays around with an eighth one. But this would be a maybe highly meaningful. If those pictures mean anything at all to students, it'd be easier to remember them. Right? And it certainly is attention grabbing and pleasing because of all the bright colors. OK, so that's during the lesson. And I'm sure you guys are going to have many more ideas for us to look at as well. Uh, but I wanted to keep this sort of brief. Uh, now, what about after the lesson? Remember, we want to have closure. We want to have some way of assessing the learning that the students have been doing and give them opportunities to rehearse it. So for closure activities, we require students to summarize what they've learned in this immediate sense or before it escapes them, right? So th there's nothing like organizing your thinking before you get to the parking lot and drive home and try to study hours later. So this is a really good process. They are going to complete the rehearsal process. That's what really stores the information away in long-term memory. And they're going to be able to make it meaningful to them. So if you remember from earlier talks, sense, making sense of something and having it be personally meaningful is essential for retaining information. 
Okay, so here's an example. We just had gardeners. I would have, if I were teaching this, I wouldn't have flipped through it that fast. But um, this is an example. If we had gone over this in class, then we could have a little bare bones one like this, and students could see if they could remember it or draw the image, right? Maybe they could do the what it was or um, do the image, either way. And then, um, the, remember the question on Twitter? It turns out that we can make use of something students love to do anyway by inviting them to um, use their uh, leisure time activity to make a summary. And uh, the only thing is they can use all the little uh, shortcut glossary, but uh, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to understand it, they better tell me what the words mean in a little legend or something. So uh, that's a great idea, I think, to bring in what students like to do anyway and make the learning fun. It's also nice because uh, in order to stick with a maximum number of characters, you have to really synthesize the material and um, hone it down to its barest essentials. That's <laughs> great stuff, that kind of editing. OK, creating a narrative. So students could be asked to write a little story about what it is that they um, have learned, the material that's been presented, and make it kind of amusing. So I borrowed this little example from Judy Willis. Once upon a time, there was a lonely piece of new information that entered a brain. It felt lost and sad until it found its family amongst the related memories in the hippocampus. OK, so that's got a couple of really important <coughs> things about memory in it. One of them is that the hippocampus is the part of the brain that stores information for, uh, in long-term memory. So um, that's uh, pretty good to include that. And also, it is true that long-term memories are stored by neighboring or families of information. Right? So that's a, another good clue for that little story. If you were going to illustrate the story, that again engages another part of the brain. It would take time. Students might want to do that and, you know, for homework. But um, one thing about art is students are usually willing to do their homework. OK, and then here's a nice graphic organizer that's kind of fun. Again, I think that's really important for the pre creating that positive environment in the classroom, that what we're doing is engaging and fun, and it's not supposed to be dull. So uh, you know, all the what, where, why, when questions are important when you're creating a narrative. And then this would be an example of scaffolding, which we talked about last time. It's students like, what do you mean create a story? So you say, OK, well, think if this helps. Start asking yourself you know, these questions about it. Pair share or collaboration is another possibility for after if you're going to use this as a closure activity. So get the students to talk about something relevant to what has been presented that day together. All right, so doing it in pairs will cut down on social loafing. If you have large groups, there are going to be people hanging out doing nothing. So the, um, you would want to probably keep that to two, three, four people at the most. And then teaching someone information. So if you have one student turn to the other and say, I want you to summarize for your neighbor what are the relevant points of what we just covered. And then maybe your neighbor could pay attention to what you're saying and tell you if you missed anything that they think was a relevant point. Right? So that would be the next one. OK, so now we're ready for a closure activity. I would like you to turn to your neighbor and um, try to summarize the material I've covered in this brief PowerPoint presentation. You could even use, um, if you need scaffolding, uh, you can use the uh, thing that I started. Or if you have your own way of organizing it, that's wonderful too. So okay, I'll give you some time to do that. Yeah, what I just talked about. I can't join you. Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. I'll come over and talk to you.
So do it on paper, please. Yeah, do it on paper. Yeah, the, the T's on the trailer. The T's on the trailer, yeah. So, so what's the core central idea? The core central idea is um, retaining information. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that would work. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, wake up. Are we working in this? Are we working in this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're going to summarize it in a, in a pictorial form. Yeah. No, don't turn it to me. I need to do this. Okay. Do you want to start with the one I suggested? Okay. It's probably the easiest thing to do. You can do it. You can do your own organization if you want to. So we get into the retaining info, and then it's the. Do a prediction. Right. Prediction. Okay, I'll come over there. What do we know about the top? And, and I like the, the, the top, the, the point she made about current events. I use those all the time. And I like how there's tons of them. So I do, I, what I typically do is I'll find them on the weekend or whatever day. I clip them, okay. put them on the page, Xerox it, and I give each one, right? And then we talk about it. I just had one this last week where a social scientist we had talked about the week before, James Q. You know, guys, it would be so cool if I could have these to see how it came across. Would you be willing to let me have them and look at them? Yes. Okay. All right. That'd be great. Okay. We're doing a closure activity. I didn't do all the so, I'm going to be like, say it organizing. Oh, it's like, yeah. 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 Maybe there's a way to work a timeline in, time line in as part of the graphic organizer in the kind of That's really that don't really <laughs> Yeah, maybe we will write something. Yeah. And there, uh, write a paragraph about what we learned. Right, right. And that's the kind of, you know, that's to set up the, you know, complexification of information and then the results of that. So we can make a Yes, and then we have to write an example. Oh, yeah. Right, cool. So we're going to pick the, so the music kind of. Let's do something. So this is in. Well, that might be yeah. considered so the past in the prediction the summary. Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. like to evaluate. Yeah. Yeah. We can just yeah. do yeah. Yeah. Board yeah. 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 Okay. That's and that's a good one. Yeah. 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 Compare and contrast. Right. 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 Yeah. Graphic yeah. organizer. Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast. Predictions and what they know. Participation. It's absolutely wonderful. 
simulating ideas, attention grabbing, a tease, or predicting, and realize that, that those kind of actions come mostly from the instructor or the teacher. And then the during included sharing, acting out, comparing or contrasting, and organizing. And that seems to be more of a joint participation between the teacher and the students. And then the after included summarizing, telling a story, or previewing new content. And that would be mostly from the students. So, so it kind of went through. What a great way to organize it. I wish I thought of that. It's yeah, <laughs> wonderful. I'm coffee. OK. That's <laughs> okay. Also, do you want to go next? Um, um, we came, you know, uh, promoting thinking. And we had the attention getter, the hook, the music. Um, the trailers, we felt the trailers could be right in the beginning, could be the middle, could be the end. You know, the trailer to come up um, for next week. And then the K W L. Um, we have the activity, you know, collaboration, predictions, scaffolding, sharing, um, and the summarizing. How does it relate to you? The tweeting, the texting, and uh, also the trailer. And one of the uh, ideals about the at the end of the class is with the trailer showing what's to come next week, and then having different groups one particular group at a time, but during the semester, pick the music that they predict would go with the topic of which 
is going to fall into. Isn't that nice idea? Yeah, that's what we did. Yeah, okay. How about you guys? Yes. Okay, part of what we with the starting with the T's and just conceptually we, we looked at it like a pipeline, like you have the T's on the outside and then right down the middle of that is, is that you want them to retain the info that is connected to that T's. So we started with a prediction and then uh, worked into the presenting the information. Uh, as we moved into the, the closure of it, we, I think we were a little stronger on the, on the closure part of it, but we had a graphic organizer. Uh, we wanted them to compare their predictions with what they actually knew and then use the, the ones that they didn't get right as those teachable moments, reinforce with the positive ones. Then we wanted them to sit and maybe write a four or five sentence paragraph on what did you learn in pairs, each writes one. Then they get together and they put one together out of both. Uh -huh. Then they get up and they do like a three minute presentation <coughs> to the class or act it out in some way and share their information. Wow, that sounds powerful. Great. Okay, well, at this point, I think it's time for a break. Thank you. Oh, you guys, wait, I thought you were on my Okay, great. Yeah. One more to go. I don't know if I stand, I was waiting for this. It's just about. more reinforcement. <laughs> well, we just, um, we drew like our own little star, and we drew like a brain in the middle with an independent thinker, and then each little point of the star was just like the little activities to reinforce the independent thinker. So just to kind of summarize, like setting the environment, um, we put music, uh, movie trailer, and then, um, you know, having the make of the predictions. Um, I kind of like the, the quiz idea with the predictions. Um, and just finding out what they already know um, in that moment but before you even start discussing some of the things. Um, and then during the lecture, I'm a big fan of novel picks. Um, even if they're kind of goofy or silly. Um, I noticed that they're the most attention grabbing though. And, and people tend to remember that information connected to that random picture um, in the news, you know, incorporating current stuff. Um, advertise for the next lecture just to kind of hook them and keep them interested. Um, and then the, cl the closure out activities, the narrative and the tweets. Um, so that's kind of what we did. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. All right, so we'll take our break and then uh, see what you came up with for homework. And uh, thanks for being here on this beautiful day. What a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We left off last time talking a little bit about the relationship between flow and the zone of proximal development. And so what I decided to do was just flush that out a little bit, give you guys a little bit better sense of uh, what flow is and what it means for how students can think in the classroom. Um, so. The way these things tend to go together, um, they were actually, both of these ideas, flow and the zone of proximal development, are developed at about the same time. Uh, the zone of proximal development goes back a little bit further, but they come out at about the same time. And the interesting thing about flow is Chase Mahaya was really interested in trying to understand something that most people hadn't tried to understand before, which is the phenomenon of enjoyable experience. Like, what is happening? when you are immersed in something that you truly enjoy. Right? That's what he wanted to uh, explore because he was talking to a variety of artists and they would talk about how they would get involved in something that they were passionate about, right? working on a painting, working on something they were writing. And they wouldn't eat and they would lose track of time. And the next thing they knew would be 3 o'clock in the morning, and they hadn't seen anyone, and they hadn't eaten anything. And the only thing that was stopping them was basically like the breakdown of biological functions, that their body was basically demanding, you need to actually be a human being for a little while and withdraw from this experience that so engrossed you. And so uh, what he wanted to do was try and find out well, what's going on, right? What is happening? Because that is a very powerful experience for people that have it. And so he starts in, 19, in the early 1970s, first publication in 76, trying to identify the key aspects of that phenomenon for people. Right? So he starts out with interviews. Later on, he starts to try and get people to try to figure out how to get people into that state. But one of the things that you see is this sense that once you hit that zone, right, that your conscious control 
right? The part of ourselves that's kind of outside of ourselves, that looks at ourselves, seems to diminish, right? That what's the behavior that you're doing, the activity that you're engaging in, seems to proceed as if it has a life of its own, right? That's just a phen phenomenological experience. That's not actually what's happening, right? You're still controlling it. But the part of yourself that you normally experience as controlling the action mm -hmm. recedes a little bit. Um, and, and part of the consequence of that is the, the aspect of the self that's very conscious, that tends to be more self-critical, it recedes, right? It backs off from the actual uh, activity, and you become immersed in what you're doing. Uh, and so it's a state of total involvement, immersion. Um, what other characteristics come up? So you have the merging of action and awareness. That is, you're not aware of yourself in the way that you're normally aware of. You're aware pretty much almost entirely of what you're doing in the moment. Uh, the self-consciousness goes away. And one of the things that's actually really remarkable and very distinct from what we normally experience is that you have this incredible concentration and focus and you don't have to work for it, right? In a lot of cases, right, when we're, especially in day-to-day -day life, you have something that's really important, you've got to work to focus and stay on this task. When, uh, when you hit flow, when a student hit flow, that part, that staying focused, that maintaining effort goes away, right? You just, it naturally maintains itself. Um, a lot of things that we normally worry about, right? How can we stay focused? How can I stay on task? You don't have to worry about it anymore. And part of the beauty of that is, once you don't have to worry about it as much, it's not as much of a problem, mm -hmm. right? The, that kind of meta, I gotta make sure to stay on task, goes away. <clears throat> and uh, the actual thing that he was really, that got him interested in initially was the really remarkable alteration in experience of time. Right? When we're working on important tasks that are difficult and we're not engaged, right, it seems like it goes forever and it's so hard. Um, one of my favorite stories was, uh, I think it was Eddie Murphy told a story about what it was like to work as a dishwasher and how difficult it was to stay on task and not look at the clock. So he had this deal with himself, okay, I'm not going to look at the clock for an hour. Okay, I'm gonna just stay on task. I'm doing the dishes, I'm washing, I'm moving the dishes. Okay, don't look at the clock, I'm doing it. And I'm working for what seems like forever. And I look up, and it's been three minutes, right? <laughs> and I think that's what happens in a lot of these uh, uh, experiences where we're working on things that are hard, uh, that are too hard or not engaging enough. What happens when you hit flow, you don't think about time, right? Time really goes away as a phenomenological part of your experience. It's, you're not, it's, it's absent in really important ways. Um, and so one of the things that people tend to point to is that experience when you're in flow changes quite a bit. And it becomes less outcome focused, right? That you really become so engaged in the experience, sorry, not used to being chained down. <laughs> um, you're uh, so engaged in experience that the experience itself becomes the goal, right? It becomes an autotelic experience, that you're really focused on what you're doing, not what you're trying to get, what, not what you're trying to accomplish, but being immersed in the experience. <clears throat> the thing that becomes very important and extremely relevant for the classroom is when students hit flow, when you're in flow as an instructor, right, your performance goes up. Right? And so that becomes one of the reasons that he starts to seek out some of the work that you see coming out of Vygotsky's work, that the merging between work on flow and the work on the zone of the proximal development and the work on optimal experience start to merge after that. That is, you see these really remarkable positive effects when people hit this type of flow experience. And so one of the reasons that happens is you see this real strong relationship develop uh, between zones of possible development and how Vygotsky is thinking about it and how Csikszentmihalyi is thinking about where flow happens. And they happen basically in the same exact psychological space, right? That is when you have a challenging activity that requires pretty much the full complement of your skill, right? That you're not, it's not too easy, you're not bored, you don't disengage. It requires all of your capacity. 
um, but it's not too challenging that you can't do it. Uh, usually, this works best when you have previous practice and effort. Otherwise, you have to be very far down on the uh, skill requirement. Uh, and it has to require a maintenance of effort. Right? That you have to be good at it, but you have to stay focused. Right? It requires the focus, but not in the conscious way. The other thing that's, that's very important is that the activity has to have ongoing feedback about how you're performing. Right? Now you start to look at these things, right? and they're exactly the same things that Vygotsky's talking about in the zone of proximal development. They're exactly the same things you see in work on scaffolding. Right? It maps up almost perfectly. That is, what you're trying to do with scaffolding in the classroom is try and match skill to experience right? and help students have enough assistance that they're right at that margin. Uh, I already, sorry, I, when I'm not working from the projector, I tend to skip ahead sometimes. So it's in the same space as zone of development. <laughs> there we go. Um, this is just uh, one of my more preferred graphs of the zone of proximal development, and it captured very well where flow is occurring too. Um, this is, and we talked about this last time when I tried to sketch it out on the board, right? When you have a great deal of skill, but the activity is not matched to that, right? That's boredom, disengagement. If you have too much challenge and not enough skill to meet it, that's when you experience anxiety or even shame, disappointment, anger. This is where we want students to be, right? And the point of scaffolding is to take them from this line where the zone of proximal development starts, right, to move them as far as you can this way, right? This is where learning really starts to begin. You're pushing people slightly outside of their comfort zone. And the, the point of scaffolding is move people this direction so that over time they're going up, right? They move up and over and up and over. Right, you're moving them up as far as they can in the challenge dimension so that then their skill can move as far as it can in the uh, development of competence. Yeah? But then the scaffolding keeps them from being over the anxious. Right, right. So, uh, the, right, so that, uh, if you didn't have scaffolding, right, if you didn't have scaffolding built in, like the scaffolding basically pushes this line this direction. So if you didn't have scaffolding pushing that line, what ends up happening is they're in a space where they're being challenged too much. Right? So scaffolding allows you to expand into the anxiety space to provide students with a broader zone of possible development than they would otherwise have. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what I think is really powerful uh, when you put these things together is it tells you a lot about what's happening inside the student's mind. And that there are some really uh, very interesting neuropsychological changes that happen when students are in this state, uh, when that's, you've mapped their zone of proximal development, when they're in something approaching flow. One of the key things that happens is you, uh, and you can kind of see that in the way that Csikszentmihalyi originally describes it, right? There's a quieting of the, of very large sections of the analytical portions of the brain, right? The left hemisphere activity tends to go down quite a bit, and very specific subcomponents, uh, verbal centers in particular, tend to be much quieter. And other areas of the brain, right, things that tend to be more visually oriented, more creativity oriented, uh, in some cases more tactilely oriented, tend to be much more active. And it also happens in stages. That is, typically happens, uh, and then you can imagine this happening with students in the classroom, right? That you start off paying attention to the task, then you have interested or more engaged attention to the task, absorbed attention, and then essentially merging. Uh, for me, when I, the, the first experience I really had with flow was as a child uh, reading, right? That if I found the right book, I would go through these stages so fast that you could say whatever you wanted to me at whatever volume you wanted, and I would not respond. I was completely undistractable. Right? And that's what you're hoping for for some of these types of experiences. You want to get students to the point where they can engage in the task in a way that they cannot be disengaged easily. <clears throat> Why does it matter? Right? Why is this important? We've talked about some of the reasons. Uh, there are some other reasons that flow out of the psychological aspects. 
One of the things that human beings have struggled to do is deal with how we control our own sense of self and consciousness. Um, and one of the things that happens with flow is you actually get the ability to turn some of the things that can interfere with your performance off. Consciousness is a natural universal thing. People have been studying this for centuries. Basically what happens is consciousness exists as a way to tell you something's wrong. Pay attention to this, right? Interrupt whatever else is going on. You need to focus on something else. When you have a task that you want to engage in, that's a problem, right? You need to diminish that interrupting, scanning the environment, searching for problems type of thing to focus on the task. It's a feature, right, that's built for a reason. It helps us to attend to emergencies or processes that aren't going well. Um, but in this case, it doesn't work very well. Uh, and so what happens is you get a much more balanced regulation of what you're thinking, of how you're feeling, that allows uh, performance that you wouldn't normally be able to approach. The other thing that it does for, for a task that you really care about is it streamlines the information you're getting, right? You're getting mostly task relevant feedback. Because you're screening out these other things that tend to distract, to uh, disengage you from the task, you're focusing your information on performance in this particular situation, which minimizes goal conflict, right? Which is a very important thing when you're trying to focus on a particular goal. Now, if you have other more important goals at the time, that's a problem. But in a classroom setting where you're trying to get students focused on a particular goal to get them to accomplish a particular thing, you want to minimize the other distractions that they're thinking about. You want to be able to get them to step away from the very many things they bring to the classroom to focus on learning the material that you, you're trying to work with them on. So it's good for the focal goal, not so much for non-focal goals. It also has other powerful benefits. Right? The more students go through these types of experience, it changes the way they think about themselves in a way that tends to defragment the self. It integrates the self in very powerful ways. It helps develop identity if you experience flow in the same situations over time, which for an academic setting, right, to the extent to which that you can have students' self-concept reorganize around, wow, like I could really engage and immerse who I am in this particular task, totally changes their relationship to the material. The other nice thing is there are huge benefits to how a student feels about themselves. Um, one of the things that uh, Chiksamahaya found is that flow is a very significant component of most leisure activity. When people seek out leisure activities, that's the type of thing they typically seek out. Not exclusively, but they want immersive experiences that allow them to set aside all the other goal conflicts that they normally have, all these other things that bug us. You want to be in a situation where you're immersed in the fun, relaxing, enjoyable thing that you care about. <clears throat> it's also a significant component of intrinsically motivated activity. Right? Things that we care about that are personal to us, that's where you see a lot of flow. The more time that you spend in flow on a regular basis, the greater the quality of your judgments of your life. Right? And so to the extent to which that we can help provide students that experience in the classroom, that carries over to how they feel about how their lives are going. It increases concentration. It not only increases concentration in the task, but it gives you practice on concentration, which is also helpful. Creativity it increases positive affect on a daily basis. And it's very correlated with how one evaluates oneself. It changes the way that you think about who you are and what you can accomplish. Um, and it's also actually pretty related to parental competence. It's pretty funny. Um, that is, bo in both directions. Stu uh, parents that are more confident tend to produce kids who have more flow. Uh, and kids who have more flow tend to develop into more competent parents. Um, and then when you look at uh, adolescents, adolescents that experience these types of things either at home or in school, right? they experience this sense of being able to immerse the self in the task, they do better on a whole variety of things. Right? They have much more positive mood in general, higher levels of social engagement and activity with their peers, uh, much more positive self-concept. And when you track them into the future, they tend to be much more happy adults. 
right? So there's all these benefits that flow on both sides of these things, right? So the, zone, the work that shows that you really get maximal learning at the zone of proximal development is very powerful for the academic context. But for the holistic student context, right, it also has all these other benefits that flow. Right, so these two things together are very powerful in producing outcomes for students that are both academically oriented, but oriented towards just general success in their life. The, the one last thing that I wanted to add on to this, so the, the other group that flows out of these two sets of work together, flowing uh, in the zone of proximal development and scaffolding, um, I skipped ahead of slide. So can you help students experience flow? Yes. 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 OK, good. Um, you can increase the likelihood. You can't necessarily force flow, but there are really powerful things that you can do to help increase flow in the classroom. Some of them we've already talked about, right? Engaging in uh, attention to the students that helps meet them where their level of skill is to try and provide them the support uh, at that level is powerful. But then there's all these other things that you can do based on Chicksamahaya's work. So you balance the challenge to the skill level. You're pushing students to the limits of their skill. Another thing that you can do, and this is why when people talk about scaffolding that it's important to walk around the classroom, the immediacy of the feedback of how the task is going turns out to be very important. right? So that the student knows that the experience is going at the, in the way that you, or in the way that it's supposed to be going. Uh, the more practice that you can have that increases or routinizes the skill, the more students will likely be able to flow around that type of skill. <clears throat> the, to the extent that you can provide or encourage intrinsically oriented aspects of the task, right? So, and this is something we talked about last semester, right? Finding the avenue to the task that the, that the student themselves finds important to them that is something that helps lead them to these types of experiences. Another really important thing is to set up the environment. Uh, when I used to talk about this with my students, the analogy that I would use is do you want to set it up just like you would a date that you want to work well, right? right? You want to have everything just right, candlelight, music, you dim the lights, your song, special outfit, flowers, whatever you want, right? That's not the classroom environment, but that's what you want to think of. Like when you want a date to go very well, you make sure that everything goes right. You've set everything up and you've thought about what the other person likes and what their favorite things are. Same thing for the classroom, right? You want to set up the environment so that it has the things that students like, that you remove distractions, that you increase the positivity of the environment, and you provide the minimum support necessary for the desired outcome, right? Just like you would in a date situation, right? You want to say, this is exactly what I want. Right? You want to provide just the right amount of support so that the student, in this case, gets to there with the minimum uh, amount of intervention from you. So the next step then is how can you push it further? Right? How can you go further than uh, flow? Flow gets you a, a lot, but you can actually push performance even further than that. Um, and there are situations where you can actually get performance, achievement that exceeds what students typically feel that they're capable of. <clears throat> they become more efficient, they become more creative, more productive, uh, or otherwise in some way better than they usually think that they can uh, reach, or they achieve some type of superior performance. Uh, and this is often associated with a complete absence of awareness of what happened. Right? So when you try and ask students about how they got there or how you could recreate it, most of the time people can't identify exactly what happened. But the good news is, a lot of the same things that are associated with flow are associated with this. You want to set up the environment so flow can occur and provide training over time that allows people to reach for a more optimal or, or better performance. So keeping people in their comfort zone and challenging them to the end of it, uh, one of the things to help students is it's very important for peak or optimal performance to help them find a way in advance of flow to start the quieting of the self-doubt, right? To encourage the ability to say, I can, in fact, achieve this. <clears throat> the focusing on the moment-to-moment -moment activity, being self-aware but not self-conscious, and setting the stage in just the same way we talked about the preliminary preparation. <clears throat> One of the things for uh, some people find effective, some people find that completely doesn't work for them because they don't 
buy, buy it essentially, but it's things that allow you to engage in consciousness clearing types of exercises or meditation can be helpful for some people. If you don't believe in it, it will not help you at all. It's zero, right? If you are someone that thinks meditation is bunk and you try to meditate before a task, it will actually make performance on the task worse. <clears throat> okay. Um, the other thing that we talked a little bit about was the cooperative learning. Uh, someone had brought it up as something they had done in the classroom. Uh, and I didn't have enough time to pull more of it together. But the Jigsaw Classroom, there's uh, Elliot Aronson started with the Jigsaw Classroom. And there's at least eight specific variants now um, that really kind of pull those things together. That you divide up the classroom task. You help uh, individual students in a particular group learn a particular thing that then they are responsible for teaching the rest of the classroom. Uh, so they have a portion of the knowledge. Uh, and this helps you to create a supportive and interethnic environment. Mm -hmm. Are we OK, or did I screw something up? OK. Um, and you help them to work cooperatively in a way that hopefully they can be supportive of each other. Uh, it has all kinds of positive effects. It increases positive peer relationships, peer cooperation. Outside of the classroom context, it doesn't work as well. But the good news is we're in a classroom context. So we have a situation where it tends to work very well. Um, and in fact, there's a real substantial number of elementary schools out there that use this type of concept or one of the variants on a regular basis. It's something that's so powerful that students have, uh, and that students just respond to naturally that elementary schools all over the place have adopted this as a way to help students engage with their, their education themselves and to generate the other positive relationships to each other. And it also has very significant um, effects on reduction of prejudice, which is why it was initially initiated. So that's the two things that we kind of wrapped up of uh, last time in a little bit more detail. Um, and that's what I have for this, uh, the, the, the post last session wrap up. So yes. When you have the students that each have a portion of the knowledge, is it typically groups of students? Right. So what you typically do is you have multiple groups. Mm -hmm. You teach one group. Uh, so let's just say we have 20. Mm -hmm. And we divide them up into groups of four. Right. Mm -hmm. So you teach one group of four a key aspect of the knowledge and only that group. Right. And then group two gets a different part. Group three gets a different part. And then you take one student from each group and you create a new group. Right. And so one student in the new group knows each thing, but they only know one thing. And then they become responsible for teaching each other. So they don't go from one entire group doesn't go and teach another group? No. Ah, so see. each student okay. then is responsible for teaching, okay. in that scenario, four other students the thing that they've learned. And um, it takes some time to develop that well. And there's some risk, right? Because if you have, well, the risk would be if you have a student that um, is somewhat introverted and they're paired with someone in the group that's let's just say aggressive, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, that can be a bad mix. Mm -hmm. And so as an instructor, you have to be very attuned to making sure that something like that doesn't go awry. But there are a lot of circumstances where introverted students benefit a lot from this. Mm -hmm. it, it brings them out. And the other students really want them to succeed because they are learning from them. And the, is another one of the possible risks that the student may not learn the material, may not teach the material in the right way, and then reinforce that. Mm -hmm. That's always a risk. Whenever students are involved in reteaching material, that's right. always a risk. Mm -hmm. And just one last question yeah. about that. Is, so then I'm assuming that the instructor is then walking and monitoring and listening to if their cues are, they're giving the teaching cues to the other students, and that's how you would. As much as you can. There's also usually a wrap-up session where you try and make sure that whatever the key elements that you want to make sure that students know mm -hmm. get um, reviewed. Okay. okay. Right? So that if you, there's something that's really important that everyone must know, then everyone will get that for certain. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>